In the beginning, darkness was on the face of the earth. And God said, let there be light. And God created creatures of every kind. But humanity has exploited his creation in the name of the almighty dollar. Until today, thousands of species are on the brink of extinction. But there are those who are acting to save endangered species before it's too late. Every day for millions of years, the humble frog has serenaded the setting sun with its chorus of croaks and calls. From steaming Madagascan jungles to the freezing tundras of Northern Europe, these curious creatures have not only survived where other species have perished, but they have in fact flourished. Over these millennia, frogs have developed a number of unique adaptations. Beginning their life in water as tadpoles. Like fish, they breathe through gills, but curiously, they also have to take in oxygen through a vast network of tiny blood vessels just under their skin's outer layer. Frog skin, you see, is permeable, meaning it lets water in and out. They rarely drink from their mouths, but instead absorb water from their surroundings through the skin, storing it in a seat pouch on their bellies. Most frogs are also nocturnal and are equipped with a mirror-like layer in the back of their eyes. This adaptation allows them to reflect light at night, giving them a kind of searchlight for hunting. Frogs are not cold-blooded. Instead, they get heat from their environment. And they can also control their body temperature by changing color to affect how much heat they can absorb from the sun, or by absorbing or evaporating water through their skins. And frogs make a variety of noises. They don't just croak, some can even be mistaken for motorcycles. The secret to their dominance that has seen these remarkable creatures outlive the dinosaurs and even survive several ice ages has until only recently never been explored. For centuries, ancient cultures have known something of the mysterious powers of the frog, using them for their own ends to kill or cure. In the world's jungles, indigenous tribes distill poison from a frog's skin to tip their deadly blow darts and arrows. Whilst in Asia, Traditional herbalists have concocted medicines from frogs to treat heart disease and a whole range of other ailments. Belonging to the class of vertebrate called amphibia, meaning creatures that live both in water and on land, frogs have burrowed themselves deep into the heart of our cultural mythology, where they are both revered and reviled because of their ability to transform. The 
the princess didn't hesitate. Very gently, she leaned down and kissed the frog. In fairy tales, when the princess kissed a frog and set her prince free, she broke the witch's curse and forever created the promise of living happily ever after. But for the doomed Scottish Lord Macbeth, the promise bestowed on him by a witch's brew led him and his clan to death and madness. and boil and bake. I have newt and toad of frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog. Adler's fork and blind worm sting, lizard's leg and owlet's wing for a charm of powerful trouble like a hell broth boil and bubble. But what is it about the frog that has allowed it to become such a part of our mythology? Is it possibly because these unique creatures in fact do have some kind of supernatural ability? In many countries throughout the world, townsfolk tell tales of frogs encased in stone, only for them to miraculously emerge decades later as if from some kind of suspended animation. Though often dismissed as fairy tale, newspaper reports of a modern day incident in New Zealand might suggest otherwise. Laurie Andrews was in charge of an excavation team working four metres below an existing riverbed when his team made a startling discovery. Leading fitter, Ashley Kent, was there trimming up the back of the bank before we started the machine and he hit one of these sedimentary mudstones just with a spade and it split. And um, that's when he brought one of the frogs around to me. It was black, about an inch and a half long. I'd never seen a frog like it in my life. And it was alive because we touched the eye of it and it retracted. I think it's quite a common occurrence in, in Australia that they hibernate for several years and then come back again. But this would have been longer than several years, several centuries, I'd say. For scientists like the University of Adelaide's Professor Michael Tyler, these tales only go to fuel the mystique that has always surrounded these animals. I think we have to accept that in terms of their general appearance, frogs must be amongst the most conservative of creatures there are. It's in their biology that they are so variable, the incredible range of things that they're capable of doing, the way in which they breed, their adaptations to light, dark, cold and heat. That's where they are so very special. In our modern era, science is beginning to prove that in fact, truth is stranger than fiction. And along the way, researchers are beginning to unlock the frog's secrets. Secrets that could potentially provide a vast new pharmacopoeia for humanity. Imagine if we could harness the frog's ability to regrow limbs. It could mean the end of physical deformities or allow doctors to replace limbs lost or amputated due to road trauma or war. Even more fantastic is Australia's stuttering frog. Scientists believe that once it reaches maturity, it appears to stop aging, staying forever young. If we could unlock those secrets, could we finally discover the secret to immortality? Though serious research into frogs is relatively new, scientists have already made some startling discoveries. In America, researchers have developed a new painkiller from the poison skin of South America's dart frog that's 200 times more potent than morphine, yet completely non-addictive. Meanwhile, in Australia, scientists like Professor Tyler, one of the world's leading researchers on frogs, has also made a number of significant medical breakthroughs, such as the cure for gastric ulcers from the chemistry of Australia's now extinct gastric brooding frog. This, he says, is only the beginning. 
And we've got a new surgical glue, for example, which, uh, upon which we now have a world patent, which we're working on with CSIRO, which is our government scientific organisation, to try and work out the exact structure of the molecule so this can be manufactured and used. But we've been able to show that in the case of sheep, that we can stick cartilage, living cartilage together and get it completely healed in about six weeks. The range of benefits from these simple organisms is absolutely phenomenal. In the past, research leading to these types of discoveries meant that the frog's life was sacrificed. But after a visit to his acupuncturist, Dr. Tyler decided to use a similar technique. Using an electronic stimulus, he found he could effectively milk these required compounds from the animal without killing it. This frog is called Littoria splendida, the splendid or magnificent tree frog. And the sort of chemicals that it's got inside here are of enormous variety. There are some which are antibiotics. There's one which is a mosquito repellent, and that's why the frogs don't get beaten by mosquitoes, but I do. Um, we've got all sorts of compounds. Uh, generally, in each species, we get at least 15 compounds that are new to science. Then we've got to ask ourselves what they're for and try and find out what they do. There we are. There you can see the creamy white solution coming onto the outside. These are the chemicals. But just as scientists are starting to unlock the frog's secrets, entire species are disappearing right across the globe at a rate virtually unprecedented since the demise of the dinosaur. Some of the reasons explaining this extinction are already well known, pollution and loss of habitat being among the chief causes. but these alone can't explain the rate at which the frogs are disappearing. For Dr. Tyler though, as distressing as the loss of such a valuable animal is, the alarm bells are ringing not only for the demise of a species, but for the demise of the human race itself. Frogs are the highest form of life to lay naked eggs in water. Therefore, they're very, very good indicators of environmental health, and particularly aquatic environmental health. And if the frog numbers are going down, then it's a warning to other creatures such as us that there's something terribly wrong with our planet. Deep in the heart of New South Wales Tidbinbilla Nature Reserve, scientists are battling to save one of the world's rarest frogs and Australia's most endangered, the corroboree frog. Gaining its name because its spectacular colourings mirror the face paint worn by Aborigines in their ceremonial dances or corroborees. The frog was once commonplace in this area, found in their thousands. Today, there are less than 100 left in the wild. Researchers recently identified that there are in fact two genetically separate species of corroboree frog. Both are ideally adapted to the alpine environment of Tidbinbilla's Mount Kosciuszko, home of the southern corroboree frog, and the surrounding homeland range of Mount Brindabilla, home of its cousin, the northern corroboree frog. Because both species have antifreeze components in their body cells, they can safely hibernate during the highlands' icy winter, returning unscathed during the spring for breeding. Though humanity's impact on the planet's wildlife is increasingly well documented, it is Mother Nature herself that can be just as devastating. During the 1980s, the nature reserve, like the rest of Australia, was in the grip of a major drought, and population numbers of both species plummeted. As if drought wasn't enough, a devastating bushfire in the summer of 2003 ignited, sweeping through the park and burning out large areas of the frog's breeding grounds, killing at least 50% of their remaining adult population.
But despite Mother Nature's fury, scientists were still suspicious that perhaps there was another reason for such a dramatic decline. Senior wildlife ecologist Murray Evans and National Parks and Wildlife worker Dave Hunter are part of Project Corroboree, a rehabilitation program set up to try and save the frogs before it's too late. The Captive Husbandry Program has two main aims. The first is to breed corroboree frogs so that we can re-release them in areas where there are very low numbers to help bolster those populations. The second aim is that in the unfortunate event that the northern corroboree frog becomes extinct in the Brindabella Ranges, then we have um, an arc situation that gives us options for the future. Since the program started, the scientists have found that the species is continuing to decline, something that will be to our greatest shame. I think it's important to preserve biodiversity because it greatly enriches human life. And I also think that frog species can potentially be very important to humans. We've discovered many new chemicals that can help us in areas of medicine in frog skins. Their frogs are often referred to as, as walk, walking pharmaceuticals. They have many interesting properties within their complex skins. And also I think that they have their own intrinsic value and, and right to survive and is a great loss to humanity when we contribute to the extinction of species. Hey frog! Hey! There he goes, so he answers. That's why, the way we find them when we're looking for them at Kosciuszko. We walk around the mountain, we yell out, hey frogs! And they usually answer. And that's it's because that is at the frequency of the frog. You hear him calling there again. Jerry Marantelli runs the Amphibian Research Centre in Melbourne. He's working hand in hand with the scientist of Project Corroboree in the fight to save the species. Well, this is a corroboree frog breeding facility and in here we have uh, frogs that live on Kosciuszko, uh, the coldest mountain in Australia and the tallest mountain in Australia. So in every one of these tanks there are frogs, tadpoles or, or uh, young frogs, metamorphlings. These dry bogs like this, which would normally be full of water in the winter, uh, dry up over summer and the frogs breed in them. By the mid-1990s, Jerry, like other scientists the world over, was baffled that frogs were not just dying out in polluted areas, but they were also disappearing from pristine environments. And when the last survivor of the sharp-snouted torrent frog died in his hands, he vowed this destruction had to stop and opened the Amphibian Research Centre, dedicated to the research and conservation of Australia's unique frogs. A few people got to the idea of thinking that perhaps it was a disease because the way that the extinctions occurred was in one part of the country, the next part, and it looked like it was moving along. Whatever was happening was moving along. Nobody could find what the disease was. In the mid-1990s, um, myself and a few other people working together on a, a, a group of captive frogs and some wild frogs that were dying out, were able to discover a disease which is now known as the chytrid fungus. Scientists know that the fungus lives on the frog's skin, causing damage to a protein called keratin, which gives the skin its rigidity. But they are still uncertain as to what happens next. One theory is that the fungus releases some kind of toxin. Another is that as frogs breathe and drink through their skin, the source of humanity's potential new medicines, it's possible that the fungus kills by somehow disrupting this ability. The chytrid has wreaked such damage that Jerry's centre is something of an arc for a number of species that were once commonplace, such as the growling grass frog and the spotted tree frog. But humanity too has also played its part in the frog's destruction by introducing foreign species such as trout into the ecosystem. And what's happened in a lot of places is that trout haven't completely wiped out the frog. What they've done is they've pushed them up into small sections of stream above high waterfalls where the trout can't travel. And where you've got a small population of frogs locked away in an area where they can't go anywhere, apart from being eaten by trout, then they're subject to other, other problems coming in and causing them to be wiped out. And in the case of New South Wales, the very last population of spotted tree frogs left in New South Wales was then uh, blocked in a small section of stream like that by the trout and wiped out by the chytrid fungus. And if we have a look in here, maybe we'll find Dirk, who's the very last spotted tree frog that's come out of New South Wales. And we have been breeding him with Victorian females to recover the species in New South Wales.
With the mystery cause of the extinction now identified by Australian scientists as a fungus, the next step was to fill in the missing pieces and to try and stop the disease spreading. As is so often the case when dealing with extinction, humanity is to blame. Somewhat bizarrely, the fungus was traced back to the development of the human pregnancy test, and that, in Australia at least, the secret to its spreading was hidden in a box of bananas. The world's first pregnancy test involved injecting a woman's urine into the African clawed frog. If the woman was pregnant, a hormone in her urine triggered the frog to produce eggs. So popular was the test that the frogs were exported worldwide. And that's when the trouble began. But what no one realised was that the African clawed frog also carried a devastating fungus, chytridiomycosis, or chytrid disease. Diseases like the chytrid fungus have taught us a very important lesson. When a disease gets to a country and moves around, and we discovered it was moving around on our native frogs who travelled in things like bananas and pot plants and other things of that nature, they go to fruit shops and everywhere, and people would get this lovely little frog say, oh, I'll let it go in the wetland. And that's taught us a, a, a very horrible lesson because it helped move the chytrid fungus around, but it's taught us something else. There are other diseases out there, and they are coming. And when they get here, we'll need to try and have a method of stopping their spread or slowing their spread. In response to the accidental spread of infected frogs and in an attempt to make sure nothing like this happens again, the Amphibian Research Centre has set up a lost frog's home in Jerry's home state of Victoria. The idea is that people can bring frogs to the centre, where the strays will be collected, checked for disease, and if they're clear, adopted to schools as pets. If the future for our planet is to include any frogs at all, the battle has to be waged on two fronts. Ongoing research, and education. So this is a frog that is good at climbing. So if you watch the way he can swing from my finger, even just by one toe. Can you swing upside down from the monkey bars by one toe? So at schools said, around yeah. Victoria, the lost frog's home hits the road. This frog has brown and green, the colours of the habitat that it lives in. It has huge webbed feet. Look at how big its feet are. That's the tip of its toe. And that's its By firing end. children's imagination and making the natural world fun, Jerry knows that his message will go way beyond the classroom. Imagine if Ian Thorpe had feet as big as this frog. His toes would be out to there if he was standing here talking to you. I think he's had two cockroaches today. There is the... Students There's Julia the Amdros and Annabelle Obergang are two who have taken the frogs to heart. After Jerry came in and spoke to us about green tree frogs, which come from Queensland, we decided to adopt a few of them. That one's Rubit and that one's Fredo. We feed them about three co cockroaches every day and it's really interesting watching them because they eat really strangely. They push their eyes down when they eat and it's really interesting. If a frog jumps on you, you won't get injured, OK? But if you jump up and down on a frog... Children frog have a chance not only to grow up and be different, frog. but to go home and impact on their parents. <laughs> their parents that have decisions in large companies to make, their parents who are politicians, and their parents who, at home, can make a difference by their practices. I didn't like frogs before Jerry came in and talked talk to us, except now I find them really cool. <laughs> At the Serendip Sanctuary, an hour's drive from Melbourne, big business and education have come together to create a 250 hectare, that's around 600 acres of wildlife habitat. With support from Alcoa and the Amphibian Research Centre, Serendip has created a unique hands-on approach to nature with their latest gallery, the Frog Room. Gee, well done, guys. This is looking great. This, I feel like I'm in a frog swamp. It's a world of frogs, all alive. Yeah. Michael Hellman is Serendip's frogs. ranger in charge. Environmental education is the most important thing we really do at Serendip. It's about getting the kids here. It's the future. It's about exciting them about the environment and getting them to, to, to take positive action to change uh, our behaviours. We've put in place a range of things that, like this frog room, but also the, the frog pond, the ponding site, 
the habitat we have with broggers and busters and things like that. And we're going to say to them, hey, look, we're going to conserve and protect, and there's no good sitting back. If you can fascinate somebody and show them a creature, they will bond to that creature and they will want to preserve it. They can find out later it's in trouble, they can find out later how they can help it. But the first thing to do is absorb them with the creature and get them to understand that this is a magnificent thing to take an interest in. At Serendip, they hope their work will change perceptions about the environment. If they can show how simple their frog program can be, then they believe it can be done in many other places as well. The best time to hear and see frogs is at night, and Jerry is on his way to check out a half a million dollar rehabilitation program. Can you pop that tape on for us, please, Gina? And at the same time, do some field work into locating other disappearing species. It's a lovely night for looking for frogs, and uh, we're finding a few on the road, but I can only be in one place at one time, so that's why we started the Melbourne Water Frog Census program where hundreds of people, in fact about 300 community volunteers, are now out there recording uh, frog samples. And at the same time as I'm looking for endangered frogs, I can be listening for endangered frogs everywhere in the state. And that's a fantastic way of picking up new information. We've got uh, brown tree frogs calling there, Latoria Ewing guy. There's probably at least 25, so we'll put a 25 plus for those and probably 25 plus for common froglets as well. There's quite a lot of common froglets calling there too. One of the biggest problems in battling the chytrid fungus is the speed at which it strikes, decimating entire populations in a matter of months. Scientists are resigned to the fact that the fungus is here to stay, but there remains one hope for the future. At Alcoa's aluminium smelter in Portland, Victoria, the company has taken the fight to stop the fall of the amphibian a step further by turning their plant's buffer zone back into wetlands. The area surrounding the plant was once home to the growling grass frog. Like so many others, it was so common it numbered in the millions. But today, there are only a few thousand left in the wild. So for 15 years now, these wetlands haven't heard the sounds of a growling grass frog. In fact, 15 years ago, these wetlands weren't here. Habitat in this area had been broken up by farming, fragmented, destroyed, salination in the soils, lots of different factors, possibly even the chytrid fungus, led to the loss of the growling grass frog during, probably during the mid-1980s, during the heavy droughts. And it's wetlands like this now established by Alcoa with the habitat, the plants, the logs, the hiding spots and the predator proof fence that's going to protect these little guys as we release them from the captive breeding program. An integral part of the rescue plan is the creation of environmental safe havens. That's why habitats like these are vital if frogs are to survive. You can never save a species in a fish tank. The, the place to save anything is in the wild. If we can't keep the habitat, then we can't save the animals. But all the animals I'm working on, at least at the moment, we have a chance to fix their habitat in the wild, to remove the predator that's killing them, to modify and regrow the habitat, to reflood wetlands that were drained. And in that case, all we're doing in captivity is providing a short bridge across that troubled time for those animals so they can go back to the wild. And we hope for many of them that'll be very soon. Alcoa has spent half a million dollars already in setting up their wetlands experiment. But for plant managing director, Matt Pissner, it's a commitment that extends far beyond the balance sheet. Has it been successful? I think uh, we're pleased with where it's at now. We have a long way to go. This is one of those things that never actually ends. We continue to develop 
uh, our knowledge about the, uh, the biodiversity and what that means. And so there will be con continued uh, investments, but again, uh, when you're taking a look at biodiversity and the environment and the community, it's really, uh, it's really hard to put a monetary value on that. It's, it is priceless. Across the border in New South Wales, the state government recognised a long time ago the importance of protecting biodiversity. At the turn of the 19th century, it passed Australia's first real environmental legislation, recognising the economic connection between industry and the environment. Frank Lemkert is a scientist for the Research and Development Division of the state's Forestry Department. His job is to research the size and distribution of frog populations in the forest. If you have insect pests, a lot of them are controlled by other animals. If you lose one particular animal, you may well find you have an imbalance and you end up with a whole lot of uh, troubles in another area. So you might get insects that will come out which will eat your forest out or they might go down to your to the local farmland, eat your crops out, and it's the other animals you've lost were the ones that control them. So they may actually have a lot of economic benefit in that way too. By fitting the forest frogs with microchips, Frank continually monitors the size and position of the populations. His research is then used to create buffer zones around the forest's industry, which in turn link up into corridors of undisturbed vegetation, creating green highways for the forest's wildlife. But even in these green havens, Frank has seen some worrying signs. What seems to have happened is that a disease has got into these areas. Okay? It's not a human interference directly because a lot of the areas these frogs are in are quite pristine, national parks, undisturbed. What there is, is a disease that's been discovered recently, this chytrid fungus, and it looks like it's basically killed these frogs off in these areas of southern New South Wales and Victoria. There are close to 500 species of frogs in the world today, with new species being discovered every year. The problem is, some species are succumbing to extinction even as they are being discovered. Further up Australia's east coast, and despite the pristine environment that the Warunara National Park enjoys, Principal Technical Officer for the park, Keith MacDonald, has witnessed the loss of three species of frogs in just 90 days, one of which had only just been described. All victims of the chytrid fungus. The little waterfall frog in the wet tropics here, we don't have a photograph on it. It was only known for a short period of time, it was described in the early 90s. No one ever thought frogs would disappear, and it was one of the first to go. Keith's job is to monitor the species that remain, and along with researchers, scientists and rangers the world over, add to the body of evidence so scientists can begin to understand how the disease works. The loss of a species for future generations is of concern. What will they think of us? Will they say that we didn't care? We've got a couple of species breeding here. You can see from the tadpoles, there's what looks at the uh, stony creek frog and green-eyed tree frog. Australia has the worst extinction rate in the world for mammals and the frogs now with the chytrid fungus are up there. There are uh, bacteria, there are predators there's problems with drought, there's problems with food, but they've been able to evolve and cope with it. But when you start bringing in something like a, a chytrid fungus, then the pressures mount on this, these animals significantly. And it is of concern that the chytrid fungus may be the thing that just does the final push and they can't cope for, with it in a short period of time, bearing in mind evolving with this environment here over thousands of years they had the time to adapt. But something that comes in and wipes out a population in 90 days doesn't give any time to adapt. Okay. Now where did you find this frog today? Just in our backyard, on the ground. At the Cairns Frog Hospital, frog enthusiast Deborah Paragolotti is finding a whole new set of problems facing Queensland's frogs. And with one new disease in particular, a whole range of cold-blooded animals too. Deborah originally started the hospital as a place for people to come and learn how to treat injured frogs. 
when we first started it, uh, I might have 20 or 30 frogs in care, which was a luxury. <laughs> it was nice to be able to look after some of these things and get them back out to the wild and to learn about them at the same time. But it turns out that there were diseases active in the area that nobody else was aware of, and more and more and more frogs started showing up at the door. I'm just looking at his breathing. He's got the new fungal disease. It's a respiratory disease. Once they've had the illness for a little while, they don't like being handled either. So touching the skin irritates them and they react. We used to have lots of them come around, like living in our happy plant trees and stuff, but we haven't seen many at all lately. Um, like this is the first one in so long, so they seem to have just just vanished and disappearing. So. All the frogs coming in get a record number, so if you give us a ring to see how he's progressing, yep. please give us the record number, because we've got a lot <laughs> on the shelf. Deborah started taking photographs and sent off samples for testing. The results shocked and astonished her. A form of human cancer, widespread in, of all places, China. But if the threat of human cancer crossing over to frogs wasn't baffling enough, her patients started showing signs of yet another disease. At first she thought it was the chytrid fungus, but the symptoms were too aggressive and it left ulcerations on the body. Everybody that was turning in frogs to us was saying that they already had anywhere from one to five dead frogs already, and what they were turning into us was the last one or two that they had left. So we knew that hundreds of frogs were being knocked off by this thing in a very short period of time. Deborah worked out that whatever it was, it was being absorbed through the lungs. So it was an airborne disease. But people were also contacting her with stories about reptiles that were displaying the same kind of symptoms. The government has challenged the frog hospital to produce the documentation to substantiate this so-called new set of diseases. But with funding already stretched to the limit battling the chytrid fungus, the problem goes undocumented and undiagnosed. If it's so uh, non-specific that it kills all cold-blooded animals, airborne transmission, 24 hours incubation, this thing in a way is to frogs what SARS is to human beings. By the time anything is done, it could be too late. So Deborah advocates a captive breeding program. It's because of people like Jerry who think ahead that have set up species like that, and we need to do the same thing up here. Gee, another dead frog. We're finding a lot of these. Have to take this back to Alex at CSIRO for testing. At CSIRO's Australian Animal Health Lab in Geelong, Victoria, Dr Alex Hyatt and his team have developed a new diagnostic tool to test for the chytrid fungus. In the past, scientists used a skin scraping from a dead frog, and the process was long and laborious. But this new tool detects the presence of the chytrid DNA and is not dependent on the frog being infected. The test now only takes a day to complete, Consequently, scientists like Jerry Marantelli can use the tool to quickly define areas of infection, giving them a much needed new weapon in controlling the spread of the fungus. Got some interesting stuff. That'd be terrific. Okay. Come this way. One of the most exciting features of this work is that we came in, the group of us, when there was a national, international problem. We identified what the infectious agent was. We developed the diagnostic assays, and now we're involved uh, formulating Good policy results, for government Good ministers to draw up a threat abatement plan, which will be implemented. So that's exciting. That means, hey guys, we did something. Uh, not only did we find it and we've done tests, but we're actually doing something to prevent uh, this disease from ongoing or to minimise it, and also to show other scientists that you can use your cutting edge science to solve major environmental problems, and this is the future. That's exciting. Despite their success though, there are still questions left to consider. A an interesting question about the disease process is why tadpoles are infected and don't die, but frogs are infected and they die. 
Research has shown that the chytrid attacks keratin in the frog's skin. Tadpoles, however, only have keratin in their mouths. So while they are relatively immune, the fungus is merely biding its time till they metamorphosize into frogs when it can use the keratin in the new frog's skin to strike. Since she was a little girl, Marian Anstis has spent her life studying tadpoles. Originally a music teacher, Marian now educates community groups, hoping to convince people that they can make a difference, regardless of who they are or what they do. I've seen a difference in my lifetime. I used to hear frogs everywhere, uh, wherever I went, much more commonly than I do now, and it's very sad to hear silence. Marian has put her knowledge to good use and written a book that allows both scientists and amateur enthusiasts like herself to identify adult frog populations through the individual characteristics of each species of tadpole. The great boon that her book provides is that researchers in the field can now identify frog populations and estimate numbers during the day. Community power is the biggest power we've got. There are far more general community people out there than there ever will be scientists. So if we can all get together and all make a contribution and all feel confident that the smallest amount of information can be helpful, then we've got far more chance of raising political awareness to conserve the habitat of these animals because it, without the habitat you can forget any conservation. Though the future may look bleak for frogs and their habitat, a quiet revolution to try and save the species is slowly gathering momentum and in the most unlikely of places. In the inner city suburbs surrounding West Australia's capital, people like Vivian Alenta and John Croft have decided it's time to take action. There's a growing movement here within suburbia to give frogs habitat since they're losing it in the wetlands, we're creating wetlands in our backyards. Using compost and discarded building materials, the couple have built a network of ponds and overgrown rushes, providing a sanctuary for all kinds of wildlife, including over 20 species of frogs. In fact, their mini wetlands is so successful, it's become a breeding ground for the notoriously fussy western green tree frog, or as it's more commonly known, the motorbike frog. The importance of the sorts of things we're doing here in terms of rebuilding wetlands and particularly focusing on frogs as a keystone species, is that a keystone species is one in which, if it's absent, it means that there's something seriously wrong with the ecosystem. The presence of frogs means you've got the insect populations there. The insect populations mean that you've got a healthy soil, you've got healthy plant life. And so if the frogs are absent, that means that there's something wrong that can be fixed up by doing what we're doing here. Vivian and John's suburban wetland has also attracted like-minded souls from the surrounding neighbourhood, keen to make a difference. She believes that most people are not apathetic about our environment's destruction. Rather, we feel overwhelmed by its scale and the feeling that on our own we can't possibly make a difference. There are times when I receive two, three phone calls a day, people wanting tadpoles to start their own wetlands and frog ponds in their own gardens. Uh, there's a growing awareness of the disappearance of, of frogs and the importance of frogs. And I have also uh, a growing network, community of people who care about frogs and wildlife in general. So we talk to each other and support yeah, each okay, other. Really. You don't want to leave it for too long. Cool. Take it straight home and put your finger in the pond. Is the, if the water is much colder or warmer than this, yeah. then you need to acclimatise it by just putting the, the jar in and letting it sit there yeah, no. without pouring it in. So. David and his daughter Neve have a permaculture wetland in their backyard, providing frogs and tadpoles for anyone who might want them. For him, though, his work reaches out far beyond the backyard. I think biodiversity on a, on a local level is so, so important for me. And the idea of community, that's what my life is about, is being a stand for community. That's what's really important. It's not how big it is or how small it is. It's once there's a, a willingness to take a stand for that. 
that, that's what I believe is, is the start and the continuation of what we're on for. Meet Joe Tonga, another amateur enthusiast. As a builder, he is well aware of the way most developers clear land. But as he goes from site to site, he picks up what bits and pieces he can that might be useful for backyard habitats. That's it. Wow. I like that. What would you use to uh, protect the site a bit more? Something natural. I think um, maybe a few branches, maybe a couple of rocks, mossy covered rocks like you've got around here would be yeah. really great. Joe has taken his love of the environment one step further by running a nocturnal tour at a wetland deep in the heart of suburbia that's been saved from developers by his local council. You can see it, there's another one here. See, so the tree's covered with it, lots of food. What I'd like to do with these nocturnal tours is share with people, the average person, the Australian nocturnal life, what happens as the sun goes down. So all sorts of animals come out, particularly the frogs, that's when they hunt and they look for their insects to feed on. And it, I think it's yeah, I see it. it was tiny, and that was the tiny one. This particular frog is a banjo frog, and its last defence is a squeal. It's a horrific dying squeal, it knows it's about to die, so it fills its, its air sac with air and lets out an almighty pitch, high pitched squeal and it goes deep into your soul, you know something's about to happen to this poor frog. We're standing right at the very water's edge now, the lake's edge, and I'm almost in the water itself, but only a couple of centimetres deep. Very rich with the slender tree frogs around here, because of the type of reed that we're close to. A little bit the senses, there's something there. Some beautiful big eyes, can be green. Joe's tour is possible because of the commitment by all Western Australian councils to a metropolitan biodiversity plan. The hope is that by acting now, the councils will not only be able to preserve the few habitats that are left, but that tours like this will encourage people to become aware of the magic of nature that exists outside their front doors. Now slowly bring him up. He's in my hand now, I can feel him. For centuries, the life of frogs has been ignored. In our century, these humble creatures are sentinels against the coming environmental destruction that threatens this planet, a destruction that is entirely of our own making. Here's a little disc, look at that, isn't it beautiful? If we do nothing, we will witness the complete extinction of frogs and other amphibians, if not in our lifetime, certainly in our children's lifetime. And in the process, lose one fragile link in the chain of life. And a link that could be the key to our own survival. And we could also be condemning those yet to be born to a life at the mercy of diseases as yet unknown. Diseases that will remain incurable because we, the guardians of this planet, would have failed by letting the cure to those diseases, the humble frog, succumb to extinction. So we are left with one very important question. Are we all prepared to sit by and let it happen? Or are we going to help those who are helping the frogs to save them before it's too late?